This is the Powerlifting America podcast, and today we're talking with one of the rising superstars in the sport of powerlifting, Joy Reinfleisch. She's a 63-kilo sub-junior national champion who finished second at the World Championships in 2022. Now she's a junior, two weeks out from nationals, where she'll be one of the youngest lifters in a class. Joy is famous on social media, so you probably already know who she is, but you'll get to see a different side of her on this podcast. Before we start, don't forget that Bench World starts this weekend. After that, we've got sub-junior, junior masters, and equipped nationals in two weeks, starting June 2nd, and a week after that, it's the biggest stage in all of powerlifting, Classic Open World, starting June 11th in Malta. They'll all be streamed live live and we'll post a link on our Instagram story at powerlifting underscore America. So make sure you're following us there. Thank you to SPD and Aleko for the continued partnership with powerlifting America. If you're looking to compete in drug tests of powerlifting, whether you're just starting out or you want to compete with the best in the world, make sure you go to powerlifting-america.com and become a member. Now with that, let's get to this interview with the superstar, Joy Reinfleisch. What is up? We've got the junior 63 kilo superstar, Joy Reinfleisch. And how do I pronounce your last name? Is that right? Reinfleisch? Or is it Ryan Fleisch? Yes, you did very good. Usually people can't pronounce it. So, and it's funny, you're like Madonna, I mean, or like Beyonce, you're like basically just a you're just joy. Like, if people ask me, you know, uh, I'll be like, oh, we got to do something with joy. Like, who's joy? What's her last name? I don't even remember what her last name is. It's Joy Joy's Fitness. That's her name. <laughs> yeah. So, that's... yeah. So, how's it going? Um, it's going good. I've been busy lately. Life's just been crazy. Yeah, life has been super crazy for you. Also, by the way, I uh, want to also mention our co-host, 63 kilo open lifter, Julia Williams. So thanks for joining us, Julia. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, um, so talking about a little bit like what's been going on lately and stuff. Um, one thing that's kind of had the whole power of team world buzzing is has been Sheffield. And um, so I'm curious, did you watch Sheffield? And uh, what did you think of it if you did? I watched a little bit of it, mostly like the women's portion of it. I thought it was awesome um, just to see like so many powerful women, like even the lighter lifters, too. It was just insane to watch. And just I take so much inspiration for how hype they get before and how passionate they are towards powerlifting. So it was kind of cool to see just like a bunch of women who share the, share the same passion as me in the same space. It was cool. Yeah, for sure. The, the women showed out, they broke a lot more world records than the men did. And, um, like you said, in the lighter weight classes, they want it, you know, uh, Evie won it when the 52s. Yeah. So yeah, it's pretty interesting. Um, are you a generally like a fan of powerlifting? Do you watch like all the big meets and stuff like that? Or I know, you know, since you were a sub junior and you're super young and super busy, you know, it might not be as high of a priority for you right now, but um, what's your take overall? Like, are you a fan of the sport? Oh, I, I definitely am. I've been trying to get into watching it more. I am busy a lot, but like I try and keep up with some of the big meets and um, it. Uh, I'm also very new to the sport. So I'm kind of still learning what, meets to even watch but yeah i've definitely been trying to watch more yeah and julia do you have a question yeah yeah so um we all we all know you broke the the world record on bench and that's what you know generated all the the hype and the the fame for you on social media um so you're now in the 63 kilo class and it has some of the strongest benchers in the world you know Meg Scanlon, uh, Carola Gara, um, you, you yourself. Um, so what do you think about that? Um, what do you think about the, the 63 class, the open and, you know, where you're going to go from here? There's some strong girls in the 63 class. So I'm still kind of deciding if I'm going to stay here or move up. But honestly, I cut down the weight class and I only got stronger. So I think 63s was almost made for me like I feel the most confident at this weight and I don't know I overall feel stronger it's weird like I cut down a weight class but I feel stronger for some reason um but yeah it's definitely something to think about because there are like some really strong women in the 63s but um right now I'm gonna be a 63 for a while probably just because like I feel pretty good at this weight um but yeah, some of the benches are absolutely insane. That's like another one of my goals is to break a world record as a 63 um, mm -hmm. bench. So we'll see if that happens. But yeah, that's that's like the next goal for me. Yeah. So uh, speaking of which, I don't know if you know who owns the world record in the 63 kilo juniors and what I'm it is. Not, 
I'm not sure, but um, I know the new bench rules. I don't mm-hmm. know if they're keeping the current world record holders or how that's working mm-hmm. um, or like elbow depth and all that stuff. So I'm not exactly sure what the world record is right now or if it'll change depending on that. So. Yeah, I haven't heard that they're going to actually do any changes or anything. It doesn't sound like they're going to. Um, okay. But um, so I because I looked this up and I got it open on my screen. So I'll tell you who it is. It's Carol Agara. Um, and so, I mean, it's just really cool to think like she broke all these records as like sub junior, junior. And now she's an open and you know, she's she's the favorite to win open worlds this year. Um, she she won world games. Um, as an equipped lifter, you know, so she's an equipped lifter and a, and a classic lifter. And um, it's just cool to think that like your name is already going to start to be mentioned alongside of some of these people that are like the greats in the sport. Like she's a being that she's won on both the, the equip side and the classic side. And she's, she's you know, right up there with Leah Bavois, like one of the greatest of all time in history. Um, so yeah. And the record is 133 kilos. Okay. I um, think, you know, I think that's going to be possible in the next year or two. So unless somebody else is, is breaking that record, I think I eventually will be able to break that. Yeah. So, and I mean, your competition from Poland, um, that you battled with in Turkey, she's a huge bencher. That was, are- awesome. that was awesome. Like that was so cool. Even yeah. though like, I was stressed during the moment of it all, but like, yeah. I thought that was like, so cool to just battle back and forth for the record yeah it was awesome and and so i mean she's a 69 so maybe she won't be in your weight class but who knows where you end up going but um the future is really bright and basically no matter what weight class you go to there's extreme levels of like those are like the two most competitive weight classes on the women's i mean pretty much all the weight classes are getting extremely competitive across powerlifting uh, on both sides men and women um but obviously some of like the superstars of the sport, Leah, Corolla, Meg Scanlon, you know, um, Celine Crum, these, all of them are in this weight class. And, um, a couple of them are huge benchers, like, you know, Meg and Corolla. And then a couple of them are just like, um, huge squatters and deadlifters like Leah and Celine and stuff. So, um, it's, it's exciting. So, yeah. So, um, who are, are those uh, the people that you look up to or who else do you look up to in the sport? Um do you, I don't know. You probably know her, uh, Samantha Eugene. Eugene. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. I actually in Turkey. I, she probably doesn't know that this even happened, but I like we were in the same elevator and I was fangirling and I was like, oh my gosh, she's in the same elevator as me. And I don't know. I just really look up to her and she actually follows me back on Instagram now. And I was like freaking out when she followed me back. Also, Turbo Tiff. I love her too. Yeah. Yeah. She's she awesome. has like a boxing background. And I feel like since I did gymnastics, like, just some of the drive and determination is similar and I could just see it like before she's competing, like her game face and her focus. I feel like I just, I look up to that a lot. Yeah. You, you're very similar to her, like in build and everything. Um, like, like you're like a bigger version of her, um, cause she's a 40, uh, she's a 47 and everything, but yeah, you really, you do remind me a lot of turbo tiff. Um, for sure. For sure. That's a compliment. I love her. She's great. Oh yeah. She's a fiery competitor for sure. Um, that's so cool that you mentioned Samantha Eugenie too, because, um, there was a podcast a while back where, you know, she was on with, um, Ryan Lapida on King of Lifts and she was talking about who she looks up to. And she was on the same podcast with Leah Bavois in France. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so it's just kind of cool to see like the lineage here of like Samantha looks up to her you look up to Samantha so it's like you're all kind of part of that same tree and I mean also how cool like France is I mean everyone you're mentioning now are French lifters yeah they're French lifters are something else they're like they're insane (laughs) yeah for sure we'll have to introduce you to Meg Scanlon I think you'll like Meg too you're kind of built very similar to Meg as well um, and so I think that, I think that when you meet Meg and, uh, you know, you really like her as well. She's, she's awesome. And she's kind of, uh, like a bench God like you. So, um, I think that's a good fit for you. <laughs> so, um, what else, what else about Sheffield? I mean, do you, did it inspire you? Like, do you want to be on that stage one day? I mean, did it? Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. That's another big, one of my goals is to be on Sheffield. So 
yeah it was it was really cool to watch and it just it gave me more motivation to work harder i guess yeah and just like as a person who has really good taste in like video and production and like really good uh social media presence and everything like this like what do you what do you think about like the production of it and all that oh it was it was awesome I, even like some of the reels and stuff they were putting out i really liked like the video quality and the angles and just how everything was recorded i really liked that also yeah. gavin he i don't remember if he was on a podcast so i heard him talking about it somewhere he was talking about like how lifters nowadays have to literally put on a show for the people watching because it's not just powerlifting anymore it's also like people are watching for entertainment. So you almost have to like, I don't know, just be more dramatic, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was cool how he like, he said he was almost like just acting, but not acting like, mm -hmm. I don't know. It was, it was just really cool. Yeah. Like putting on a performance. And I think like, that's something that you can really relate to as um, a, a gymnast and, you know, being in a mainstream sport like that, where there's a ton of media attention and stuff like that. Powerlifting is kind of like in the shadows. Um, uh, people don't, aren't paying attention to it as much. Mm -hmm. So you can get like more introvert type lifters and, and athletes and stuff like this. But um, now with Sheffield, especially we're starting to see that it's like you have to, it's, it's going to be a performance. It's entertainment. And we want to make it a mainstream sport that any given person comes across. It will be entertained by watching it. Yeah. And Gavin was saying how, like, it just came so naturally to him. Um, and he just felt like he could just be himself, but like also be intense, you know, just mm -hmm. it was so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Julia, go ahead. Yeah. So along those lines, I guess, you know, whether it's at Sheffield or just on Instagram, is there any lifter in particular that you um, like to watch just for their content that you think is doing, you know, an amazing job with content that maybe you inspires your content or anything like that? Uh, her name is Cranon, actually. She oh. goes to Corrupted Strength a lot and she trains with Russ Wool. I also watch him too on YouTube and I like his YouTube videos, but I like a bunch of her content i get some inspiration from her Crazy, yeah she's yeah. she's a phenomenal deadlift. yeah like yeah, her videos a, are yeah amazing. those are insane and she gets like really hyped too which i love seeing like the female side like girls just getting hyped to lift heavy weight too it's really cool and inspiring and i feel like usually you see it more with the males but it's cool to now see like females like sniffing smelling salt and getting all hyped before the lifts i love that getting like like you getting huge back slaps and stuff and getting on, on the ammonia and everything yeah. um that's really cool yeah Cranon is a uh flex lifter and um let's see like i has she done meets i'm not sure but she's kind of like similar to you in that sense of like being like a fitness influencer beyond just powerlifting. yeah she actually just signed with gymshark and um she hasn't competed, I don't think, in an actual meet yet, but I know she just came back from some sort of injury, and she is planning on competing, I believe. I'm not sure which meet, but I know she's planning on competing in the future. Nice. Yeah, I know she signed up with Joey, and um, and yeah, I mean, obviously, he's going to eventually get her competing, and we'll see. Maybe she'll be on a Power of Teen America platform one day. Um, Julia, did you have something else? Yeah, I, I thought it was really interesting that you said, you know, like women are starting to get hyped up because um, King of Lifts did a podcast with Heather Connor um, a few, I would say months ago. And she talked about how when she on in the Asian, I guess the Asian championships, a lot of women looked up to her because she was one of the first people that like started doing that and getting really hyped on the platform. And um women haven't been able to really do that before, haven't been encouraged to do that before. So I think that's really interesting that that's something that you grabbed onto and a lot of the younger generation like Cranon and everybody is doing. And that's really changing kind of the face of what lifting is for women. So yeah, really um, I mean, when I first started lifting, I definitely was like quiet and not as hype. But then I saw even like 
Meg and Haley, who go to my gym, they, Mm -hmm. I just saw them like slapping their legs before they went or like just sniffing smelling salts or like um, screaming or something, you know, and I kind of learned from them that like, oh, it's okay to do this. Like, I don't have to be scared to like get hype and hype myself up before a heavy lift. And I think over the last year, I've kind of like, I used to be scared to get hype because I was like, oh, what if people look at me this way or not? But I kind of learned how to not care what other people think because I saw, I look up to both of them that go to my gym and Mm -hmm. I saw them doing that. And I was like, okay, like I could do this now. And now it's just, it just comes naturally. And it's something I look forward to now. Like I love getting hyped up before a deadlift or something like that. So, but it did definitely took me time to get to this point because um, I don't know, there is, I feel like some people view that as like women shouldn't be getting this hyper. That's not ladylike or whatever, but now it's like, I, I don't give a, you know what, <laughs> because like, that <laughs> makes me happy and I love doing it. So, yeah. That's huge. I mean, that that's why, you know, you're so important for the sport and, um, and, and you're so wise beyond your years because what you're 18 right now. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for 18 year olds are just naturally super insecure and very self-conscious about stuff. And so to put yourself out there and to say stuff like, I don't care what people think, I'm just going to be myself. Like, this is what gets me hyped up. This is what makes a fun time for me, makes it enjoyable for me. Um, I was going to do it. And you're like rewriting the rules then. So like, there's going to be a whole generation of people that will come up under you, like Samantha Eugenie or Leah Bavwa and all these other intense lifters like Heather Connor. Um, and, and you'll just be carrying on that torch to the next generation, but starting at a, so much of a younger age, you know, starting at 18. So, so speaking of, uh, social media and like current news, uh, current events stuff, you yourself have been a big story in 2023, oh, probably as big as Sheffield really, um, really setting the social media world on fire, um, back in January and February, you just absolutely blew up. So tell us just about your rise to fame. And like what it's like now, you know, for you, like, can you walk down the street without being like mobbed by people or like what? Uh, So after the January meet, thanks to Paul and his filming, uh, a bunch of my videos blew up on Instagram. I think our our one reel got like three million something. It was like a lot of views on Instagram, which it's harder to get views on Instagram. And then TikTok my one TikTok of me squatting 314, I think got 1.5 million likes and like 10 million views on TikTok. And that just, I think I gained a million followers in like two weeks, two weeks. Yeah. It was like around a two week period where you were just on fire every day. I was looking at your numbers and just like, wow, it was awesome insane because it's always been a dream of mine to like pursue social media not even for the followers I just I love putting together content I love editing I love all that side of it and just blowing up and finally being able to like post what I love and just have it impact so many people has been so cool definitely overwhelming um I still I'm like processing it all and it's been almost five months since then or maybe four months but I've been I'm still processing like that this is my reality like that I have this many people following me because it did happen so fast I feel like people usually gradually blow up like Mm -hmm. they'll get 100k and then through the next few months they'll gain like another 100k but like me it was all at once so it was pretty overwhelming, but um, I definitely love it, and I, it's definitely cool. I have people recognize me like at the mall. I had this one kid recognize me there at the gym. People are take, asking me to take pictures with them, and it's just like, you want to take a picture with me? Because I'm still like, I think it's crazy that like the people I used to look up to, fitness influencers, who would uh put youtube videos up of them taking pictures with people like that's me now people want to take pictures with me and that's just it's crazy to wrap my head around still um it's it's all still new to me i'm still 
learning how to navigate this lifestyle. So I don't think people realize how much time and effort goes into social media. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's like, it's my full-time job. I worked at Crunch for a while and I'm not working there anymore, but it's my full-time job. I'm editing for probably at least six to eight hours a day. And then I'm filming for a portion of my lift. So I'm usually at the gym for four hours and it's just, I'm responding to DMs and responding to everybody else, brand deals, all this stuff, coming up with content, uh, brainstorming new ideas, getting collabs, all this different kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a lot and it's definitely been a lifestyle that I'm still getting used to, but I love it and I wouldn't change it for the world now. And it's just really cool. Yeah. I mean, it couldn't have happened to a better person. And, um, you want to talk about like, um, using your powers for good or for evil. Like we know you're going to use your powers for good. Um, since you're such a good person. So it's really cool that like you have this huge platform now we know, and I just, I know that you're going to just do nothing but awesome and positive stuff. That's going to help elevate, you know, sports for women and elevate the sport of powerlifting and f- the whole fitness space. You know, you bring like a really good, wholesome Buffalo girl, uh, energy to, <laughs> to, you know, real nice person energy to, uh, the social media world where it can be a little, you know, um, you know, it can be, there's, it's a mixed bag, you know, it can be good and bad. And so it's cool that like someone that is a really a good person is going to have the, this power to like reach this many people and, and do something really good with it. Julia, go ahead. Did you have something? Oh yeah. I mean, so you've had to negotiate brand deals and, and stuff like that, as you said, um, how do you feel, you know, representing yourself and do you think that maybe um, power lifters and, you know, fitness athletes for lack of a better term could benefit from maybe professional representation um do you have any thoughts on that or i actually have an agent or like an attorney that takes care of all of my brand deals and stuff because i am 18 and i got into a few brand deals where they were just blatantly taking advantage of me and because I was so young and so new to the fitness industry and didn't really know how much I was worth and how much I should be getting paid for the amount of work and content I was putting out. Um, so yeah, definitely. If you have a following on social media and brands are reaching out to you, I definitely say get an agent or attorney or somebody that knows what they're talking about when it comes to that stuff, because my attorney has like I don't know, just helped me navigate through all that stuff and took in a lot of stress off of me having to negotiate with different brands. And yeah, I definitely recommend that. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think you start to see people getting uh, representation like yourself and stuff. It's smart. And that's where the sport's going. I mean, as, as the sport grows and as it gets more popular, um, yeah, people got to, you know, get in touch with lawyers and agents and stuff because, brands will just totally try to take advantage. Yeah. Um, but like you mentioned before too, that, I mean, it was kind of, certainly there was that two week stretch where you just like blew up like crazy. Um, and then, you know, but you have been grinding and like working really hard on social media way before that. And so, I mean, I remember back in nationals last year and even before that, like your, your last meet with USAPL, um, is whenever I started following you. Cause I knew Vin from, from back in the day and stuff like that as well. And I just kind of saw, and you, you just, you worked really hard at it. I mean, it wasn't, it was overnight in a sense where you like blew up overnight, but it was also like you had laid this foundation of putting out consistent content. So with that in mind, like what are some of the, you know, off the top of the head, like tips and stuff that you would give people who are, you know, want to grow their following. Be consistent. You can't just post one time a week and expect to blow up uh you need to be posting very consistently on tiktok especially because of the algorithm it's constantly changing um i'd say at least three times a day that's what i aim for if you want to grow your social media also don't like force your content you want it to be what comes natural to you what you like posting you want to stick to some trends but 
mostly you got to find something that sets you apart from the rest of mm -hmm. everybody else on social media because you're not gonna blow up doing the same thing as somebody else and even if you blow up for like your looks or your physique or something like that people are going to follow you because of that but you're going to keep consistent followers from like showing your personality and just being different and being okay with being yourself on the internet and just yeah I definitely say being consistent being yourself mm -hmm. are big things Instagram it's a little harder to grow uh reels are definitely helping people grow because it's kind of like TikTok on Instagram mm -hmm. but you also got to be consistent on Instagram because keeping your followers engaged is a big thing on Instagram and since Instagram pushes your content straight out to your followers if they see you posting something every day and you're engaging with them and you're posting stories and you're responding to comments and stuff like that they're more likely to keep following you and keep liking your videos and checking your profile and stuff like that but I see a lot of people trying to grow on social media and trying to find like oh, I want this brand to sponsor me and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But like, you you can't be in it for that. Like, mm -hmm. I was posting consistently for about two years on TikTok. I had 20, I actually, in my notes, I can look, I kept um, a spreadsheet of my following mm -hmm. and it was kind of as motivation because there would be some months weeks yeah. that I wouldn't grow yeah. or I would grow very little but like I was still growing so that kind of kept kept me motivated kept me uh wanting to keep posting mm -hmm. so actually the first to date I had was February 8th 2022 and I had 25,355 followers on TikTok mm -hmm. and then a year later Exactly a year later, I had 990,783, but wow. literally kept like yeah. a log <laughs> of my TikTok following. So that's actually something I recommend you doing if you want to grow on social media. So you're not focusing as much on like, oh, I didn't gain 10,000 followers in a week, but like you can look back on it and be like, I impacted, even if it's a hundred people. 100 yeah. new followers at least you're impacting and you're growing that little bit so that kind of helped me because there would be months that I would be stressed out because I was like I'm not growing um my content's not doing well but yeah. I look back on that and it's like if I'm impacting one person that's better than nobody um mm -hmm. and I feel like most people or a lot of people have the idea of blowing up and getting these brand deals and getting money from social media, but you got to have something deeper than that. Like mm -hmm. if you want to be successful as an influencer, you got to have another reason behind it than just wanting the followers and just wanting the brand deals. Yeah. Um, it sounds a lot like powerlifting in some ways where it's like, you're going to have months sometimes where you don't PR um, where maybe some lift takes a hit, you have a little injury or something else going on in your life and your lifts aren't taken off like you want. But if you look back like two years ago and you're like, wow, I'm taking my old max for like a triple or like a set of five now, or like, it's like rep work for me now. Um, it kind of helps you kind of think like, okay, just keep going, just be patient. Um, yeah. just keep putting in that hard work. Like there's no, no substitute for hard work, you know? And so like you keep being consistent, putting in that hard work, eventually, you're going to get this big payoff, you know, and, and you, you, I always kind of explain like social media stuff to people is like, you want to like create a fertile ground for something to grow. Mm -hmm. And you want to really tend to that soil a lot and like make it very fertile. And that's what really that you were doing for the last like two years was just like building up this base of content so that when people did come across your content, they immediately fall in love with you and want to follow you, you know? And, um, and then once all those eyeballs started getting on your page and stuff, it would just boom took off, you know? So that's really cool. And yeah, I remember you, you messaged me sometimes, like we we've like strategized and stuff in the past of like, um, going over so social media strategies and things like that. 
And I remember you, you're always, you were working so hard, like being super consistent and constantly trying to find like new techniques, new strategies, things like this. And I remember there's sometimes where you're like frustrated, like things aren't happening. They're not popping off. And you're just like, just keep going, you know, and you just keep, keep grinding at it and just keep being consistent. And so, yeah, I think those are great tips for people. Um, one other thing was, uh, you've kind of recently branched into YouTube. So how is the YouTube space treating you? Yeah. Oh, I love it. Gosh, it's, I love it. It's just, it's a lot of work. Like yeah. YouTube and real editing, they're, they're a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually really enjoy editing my own videos and stuff yeah. for YouTube, but it's very time consuming. But like when you get the whole video together and you could watch it after you're done editing, it's like, it's so worth it. Um, I think I have almost 12 K on YouTube, which is pretty good when I'm, I'm just starting off. So yeah. people, people have been loving my YouTube videos. I've been getting nothing but, positive feedback so yeah. i don't know it's been really good so far it is it's awesome um and i i think it's going to be huge for you because um it's going to show your personality like i know you like i've i've hung out with you in buffalo a couple times and in orlando last year and now people when they see you on these podcasts and stuff they see how nice and sweet you are and everything <laughs> and um if, if not before you're about to go out on a big deadlift or something but yeah. Um, but you know, I think it'll show your, per a, a different side of your personality because it's lo the longer form. Um, and so that is something where I think people will really get to know you better. Whereas on like Instagram, for instance, it's like, they know you're jacked. They know you're a huge bench presser and like you're, pre you know, you're working on everything. You're working on your bodybuilding posing and stuff like that, but you don't, you don't, and, and you come off as like so much more of like a badass too. Um, when really like, you're just such a nice, like sweet girl, like from Buffalo that it's so, I think it'll be cool for people to see that other side, you know? People, that's something people always, when they first meet me, yeah, say that they're scared of me. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh guys, I'm not that scary. I'm really not. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think on Instagram, I, um, just carry myself as more of like a badass, I guess. Yeah. And, Ah, I lift heavy weights, but like yeah. when you get to know me, I'm actually probably one of the most like scaredy cat people that you'll ever meet. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Down to earth, quiet. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's cool. And so I think, I think that'll be huge for you to like show, show your other personality, show your full personality and stuff. Yeah. Because you come off as a badass. you're in a super like aesthetic, like you know, badass looks with like the hardcore music, like really like hyped up stuff. Um, and so, yeah, um, it'll be cool to see. And then you, you also mentioned too, like not doing trends and stuff. Like I notice there are a lot of people that do like these, these like different kind of trends, um, in, in, in the gym, there's a ton of gym trends and you really don't do any of that, at least on Instagram. Like I I'm not on, I'm not really looking at TikTok too, too close, but like on Instagram, it doesn't seem like you really follow any kind of like trend stuff. Yeah, I just, I personally think that, like, my content and my style is what has gotten me to grow, and I don't know, I feel like sometimes with trends, you can't, you can't show who you are, because mm -hmm. you're literally following what somebody else is doing, mm -hmm. so on Instagram especially, I prefer, like, just posting my heavy lifts and kind of just showcasing what I do and my personality more because I do post some vlogs on yeah Instagram. yeah yeah and uh, yeah and usually those videos don't do as well on Instagram anyways I do follow more of the trends on TikTok not mm -hmm. that many but um yeah lately I've just not been following them as much because it's mm -hmm. just easier for me to like post the content that's been doing so well and that showcases who I am more yeah you are the trend um, people are going to follow you. <laughs> yeah. I see some of the gimmicky trends and stuff and I, it's kind of cringy to me. I think some of them are just like getting a little old. Maybe that's yeah. it. Like, like you and me, we spend so much time on social media. It's like, it just, to me, it's just kind of been there, done that. It's kind of old. I think. Yeah. Then it's very then, surface level. You know, yeah. And then you see the same video over and over and over again. And then people yeah. are not going to want to watch that. So then ultimately the video is not going to do as well if so many people are seeing the same video then it's just yeah it's repeating itself 
how do you deal with like when you put a lot of effort like you're saying you you i know the vlogs like sub vlog is your catchphrase um <laughs> and it's so amazing <laughs> i i say it sometimes to like my wife i'm like sub vlog and she's like what is that i don't even know and i'm like uh oh, you wouldn't get it but um but you know that that stuff is really takes a lot longer to edit those than it does to just like here's a huge bench um something like that so how do you mentally deal with like putting in a ton of hours into something and then have it not really like get a very big reach. Like, what do you tell yourself? Well, there's two th things that I usually do. Sometimes I'll, if I post it at a certain time and it doesn't do well, I'll try on TikTok, I'll delete it. And then I'll post it again at a different time to see if it does well. Cause sometimes it's so weird how the algorithm works. Cause I remember this one time I posted a video of my bench uh, it was like a 242 bench. I posted it at 10 in the morning. It flopped. Absolutely did horrible. I posted it at, I think, 8 o'clock at night and got almost a million views. Yeah. Same exact video. It's mm -hmm. ultimately the algorithm. So you could play around with that a little bit. Um, but then if it still doesn't do well, I just kind of tell myself like, all right, it's one video your other videos are doing well, you have more time, you have more content ideas. It's literally just one video out of the thousands of videos that you put out monthly. Like it is one video and mm -hmm. it's, I, it's obviously still like a work in progress. I've definitely gotten a lot better with it. Cause I used to like stress so much around what I was posting. And now you kind of just have to reframe your brain and how you think about it. Cause I mean, I have anxiety. So that also plays a role. Cause I'm like always thinking and thinking and thinking. So yeah. I definitely found a way to reframe and kind of just shift my mindset around posting and just not really focus as much on the views. But if it's like a video that I really wanted to do well, I will delete it and then post it again at a different time. And usually it still, it does, better at that certain time but mm -hmm. if it doesn't do well you just got to remember that it's literally one video just mm -hmm. like in powerlifting you you're going to have off days it's one off day you got to use that as motivation to have better days in the future so that's kind of how i look at it yeah that's that's awesome i mean that's why you're such a great competitor and um because you bring this mental toughness i mean even like for your age you're like ridiculously mentally strong. Like, I mean, whenever I was 18 years old, oh my God, if I um, thank God there wasn't social media when I was around, uh, whenever I was your age, cause it would be like in your insecurities so bad. And like, I mean, uh -huh. even, even as like a adult man and everything, like whenever I spend time making reels for power in America and they don't do well, it, 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 you know, it messes you up a little bit. You kind of put you in a bad mood. You're like, like, damn, I put all this effort into it. And like, oh, someone didn't accept the collab or like whatever. And it, like, oh, but then you just kind of put it behind you and just move on to the next thing. Just like yeah. you do in, in sports, you know? Yeah. Um, Julia, do you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah. So do you think that, um, social media has helped you, um, you know, coming back from a bad day, stuff like that. Do you think that that has helped you with power living, with training, you know, when you have an off day, do do you kind of relate them back to each other? And do you think that you're better off in powerlifting for having done the social media stuff, just, you know, mentally, uh, sports psychology wise? Um, I think, pro I mean, there's some days that I see, like, I compare myself to people like the other big powerlifters. I find myself comparing myself to them. So sometimes that can be a bad cycle when it comes to social media but um definitely posting like my fails and stuff even on social media mm -hmm. and people kind of relating to me and like just being able to be open and show that I have bad days and show that I fail also on social media and just have people have a good response to that is definitely helped me mentally I think and yeah. um, if I'm having like just a bad day and it's not related to lifting and then I go lift and then I hit a good lift and then I post that on social media and that does well and I'm getting super positive feedback on my lift on my reel that 
definitely helps. I don't know if that's what you were asking, kind of, but. Yeah, yeah, I guess I, yeah, that, that's kind of what I was asking, you know, just um, they definitely have similarities, like Paul said, um, in terms of, you know, growing as a lifter, growing as an influencer, that kind of thing. So that, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And then just like growing in life. Um, but yeah, it's like, if you're having a bad day or someone's like giving you a bad time, it's like, well, I can still bench 242. So, uh, I think I'm doing all right. <laughs> or if you miss a lift in the gym, you're like, well, still have a million followers on TikTok, So I guess I'm doing something right. Like you kind of got it in your back pocket as like a pick me up yeah. on a bad day. Yeah, for sure. Okay. And then one last thing about social media, um, because I know you're like the social media star and everything. So we wanted to really get some, some, uh, tips and stuff out of you. I think this has been great. Um, you mentioned before that you have to have like a purpose with your social media and it can't just be like trying to follow trends and stuff. So what is your purpose? Like whenever you think about social media, like what is it that you long-term like are trying to accomplish? So I had an eating disorder when I was 15 because I, I was a gymnast and I broke my ankle and I was unable to do gymnastics anymore. And from 15 years old, I had to basically go through, I call it my first heartbreak. Um, because mm -hmm. I lost the sport that I put my everything into since I was literally four years old. I was in the gym like six hours, a, six hours a week for like, or no, six hours a day, sorry, mm -hmm. for six days a week. And yeah. it was literally my whole entire life up until I was 15 years old. That's all I knew. I was there probably more than I was at my own house. I'd go to school. I'd go to gymnastics and then I come home and sleep and repeat kind of like lifting now mm -hmm. but um the mental health side of athletes after they're done with college or they get an injury and can't do the sport that they love anymore that's definitely something that I want to bring awareness to and mental health that is like a big big thing like mm -hmm just talking about that and helping girls be confident with having more muscle, taking up more space, not wanting to be the skinniest version of themselves, instead wanting to be the strongest version. Mm -hmm. And with the eating disorder, powerlifting has helped me so much not focus on the weight on the scale, but instead like the weight on bench, the weight on deadlift, the weight on squat, seeing that go up instead of seeing the weight go down on the scale. Like I like to tell my story and preach it to my followers. And just, I know a lot of girls have the idea of, I need to be this way. I need to get skinnier. I need to just do cardio. I can't lift. I can't have muscle muscles like gross or whatever, something like that. And the big, big thing of mine is I just want girls to be able to feel empowered and feel confident with lifting heavy weights, taking up space in the gym, being confident in the gym, because I have so many girls, even at the crunch that I work at, tell me they're scared to go out of the women's section because it is a male dominated area. And it's just, I, that's the reason I filmed a lot at crunch is because I'm around a bunch of males, but I was like, being confident, being dominant, like yeah. I just had the utmost confidence in a male dominated area. And I just want to show like the younger generation of girls and stuff that it's okay to be in a gym and take up space and slam weights and like do things that is usually frowned upon, I guess, as a female, because I don't know, I feel like a few generations ago it was like girls just be doing cardio like girls aren't lifting heavy and stuff like that but uh yeah a big thing of mine is I just want girls to feel like it's okay to be strong it's okay to have muscles and to not you don't have to like starve yourself or eat less to be happy so yeah that's that's a big big part of it <laughs> What that is an amazing answer. I mean, I cannot believe if anyone is listening to this, if they if they like disguise your voice because you sound like such a, a kid with your voice. Like, but if if you just wrote this out, like this looks like a speech from like 
a, a you know old wise adult here you know like like talking about like changing the game and like you're just 18 that's I, that was an amazing answer joy um and th that's why i know you know um you're gonna do good things with with the following that you've built um man i like that is so so inspiring what you just said go ahead julia you had a question yeah so i don't know follow her she's actually in, in the 69 kilo class um claire zai she um, has goals similar to you. And one of the things that she um, started doing with, I, I'm not sure who she uh, works with for this, is a, it's called Load Women. And I think it's like a charity deadlift event um, where everyone signs up online and they just pull a deadlift or something like that. Um, so I think that there's a lot of people like um, working in this space and it's just, it's so cool to see that um that people are approaching this from with, with Claire you know she's like barbell medicine and it's from that aspect and then for, for you it's from social media and I think it's bringing a lot of awareness to this yeah so. yeah I mean I feel like a lot of athletes especially even college athletes who go to high school or go to college after high school and they have that sport for another four years but then after that sport if they're not going to the major leagues or like mm. the NFL or anything like that, they almost don't know what to do with their life a lot of the time. And they feel just this emptiness. At least that's what I felt at 15 years old. And I think that's, that probably plays a part of why I, a lot of people think I'm wise beyond my years. That's like, I get that a lot. Mm -hmm. I think I had to go through so much at such a young age that it just it helped me mature and just have a whole different perspective on life and um the athlete thing is just not a lot of people talk about it and it's great mm -hmm. that people are finally bringing it up in the social media world and yeah it's it's really cool to see yeah gymnasts gymnasts are typically very mature for their age because like you said it's something that you start when you're very young takes a lot of discipline. You're around a lot of coaches, a lot of eyeballs on you telling you stuff, you know, you have, a, you'll get a lot of mentors, different coaches and stuff, you know, um, and your parents and still like a lot of responsibility because they're putting in a lot of effort for it as well. So it definitely like kind of forces you to mature very quickly, um, to be a gymnast. And so, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Like where a lot of your maturity and wisdom, um, comes from because you've gone through a lot of things already as yes. such a young person that a lot of people don't face this kind of adversity until like you said um, they get out of college you know they're like 22 years old something like this maybe or they have a career ending injury like after they've already been in the NFL or like at a major league uh, level or something like that and then have to deal with it you had to deal with it at such a young age that's interesting like that you you nailed on something that I think about a lot because um, when I used to photograph football players at the university of Nebraska, I would always, you know, I would, I would hit it off with some of the players and I would always be heartbroken. Like whenever they didn't get drafted, you know, cause like you start to know them, you know, their personality, you know, how hard they work. You see them on the field, like week in and week out. And you're just like, and, and all the effort. And then you see, and they're like superstars, 90,000 people screaming for them, you know, in college, like in, in, in little Lincoln, Nebraska, you know, they're like, they can't go anywhere without like signing autographs and stuff like this. And then after the draft is over and they don't get drafted and they don't get signed as an undrafted free agent, it's just like, now what, you know, like I was like the King of Nebraska or whatever, you know? And then like, now I'm just like another dude in Houston, Texas, you know, or like wherever they're from. And, um, uh, I had a couple of athletes that I was super close with that. And I was with them when they were navigating this, this process. And it was mentally really, really tough. Like there's a lot of like, you know, um, drinking and like going to clubs and, you know, this kind of stuff to try to like cover up the, the pain of like not being drafted. And, um, but you know, so it's cool. It's good that you're talking about it and that, you know, at such a young age, like since you've gone through that and you're using that to then help educate and, you know, inform people about the next, uh, of the next generation. So that's really nice. Um, Julia, did you have anything else that you want to add on that? I wasn't sure if you raised your hand. Okay. That was that was a perfect answer. So. so yeah, I mean, Joy, that is fantastic. Um, and so for anyone that's listening to this, like give her a follow. Like she's gonna do good things with your follow, <laughs> right? Like support her, comment on her posts, you know, like help her blow up because she's got a good message. 
Um, so you kind of hit on it a little bit, but I wanted to just kind of go into your backstory just a little bit. Um, for people that are listening, like you did an amazing interview where you talked about all this stuff, like very in depth with King of the Lifts, Ryan Lapidat. He's the master of these kind of interviews. So oh, yeah. I recommend you know, everyone go search for joy um, on the King of the Lifts podcast and listen for a deeper backstory. But for people who don't know you, like give us a little bit of like, you know, the uh, catch people up to speed, like, you know, where you're from, you know, like you, like you talk about, you know, you did gymnastics and just, and just like, you know, how you grew up. So I'm from Buffalo, New York, go Bills, Bills Mafia. Um, I was always active my whole entire life. I did softball also as, at a young age for about five years. And then I fell in love with gymnastics. My mom always tells me that I was flipping out of the womb, you know, literally doing somersaults. Um, <laughs> I was always on the monkey bars, you know, always just being upside down everywhere that I went. And I did like recreational for a few years. And then my coach was like, you are too good for rec classes. And then they signed me up for like it's almost like there's travel baseball and then mm -hmm. there's travel gymnastics. So it was like competitive gymnastics. Mm -hmm. And that was a whole different ball game. I think I started when I was about seven years old and it was four days a week for three hours. And also I had to take dance class too. And then as I moved up levels, it was, it got to a point where it was like six days a week for four hours each day, five hours on one day because I had dance class. And I was just like constantly at the gym training, working super hard. They push us gymnasts like hard, hard, mm -hmm. hard, especially at a young age. So, I mean, I definitely think that's why I did so well in school is because I had that discipline level from my coaches in gymnastics. Um mm -hmm. And I was state champion four years in a row. Um, I went to regionals, competed at regionals, actually with two broken feet. Uh, wow. And I competed with a broken finger as well. Like just gymnastics, you have to be so like mentally tough and just physical pain doesn't exist in gymnastics. Like yeah. you just have to push it to the back of your mind and push through it. Um, so yeah, I was pretty decent at gymnastics and it was like my passion. I wanted to go to college for gymnastics. I, I knew I probably wasn't going to make it to the Olympics. That was my goal when I was younger. But as I got older, you realize like how good you have to be. And um, it was more of a goal to like make it on a college team and just do good at a college level. And then sectionals for my high school, I broke my ankle vaulting and I was out for two months and then I got back to it. And then not even two weeks later, I rebroke it. And then after that healed again, the doctor who I was seeing sent me back too early and I broke it again. So oh. they basically told me that it was just going to, I was just going to keep breaking it. I was just going to keep injuring it. It's, it was never going to be the same. And they basically told me I couldn't do gymnastics anymore, which was like so hard for me to come to terms with being this 15 year old who just has this huge dream of being like a super well-known college athlete. And that's like all I wanted to do in life is make it on. It was actually Brockport gymnastics team. Uh, it's like a big gymnastics team around here. I wanted to be on that team so bad because all my other teammates were making it on that team and yeah I broke my ankle and I just got super depressed I'd say as um I didn't know what to do with life because that's all I did I all I did was go to the gym I just felt so lost with who I was what my purpose was and I ultimately took it out on food and started restricting and just that loss of control from not having gymnastics anymore. I had to find something to make me feel like I was in control and that was food. Um, I went to a eating disorder therapist and 
she basically told me that I was, when I started going to the gym, she told me that I was too muscular and that I needed to stop eating as much protein as I was eating. And that flipped a switch in my brain. And I was like, I'm going to prove whoever this dietitian, whatever is wrong. And I'm going to get as jacked as possible because she just told me that I shouldn't do it. So my 16 year old self was like, all right, we're going to do this. And, um, I just started going to the gym with my brother and all his friends. And that's, I just benched all the time. The first time I benched, I actually benched like 95 pounds for like five or six reps. And then not even a month later, I was repping 135. It like I gymnastics definitely played a role in that. Cause I already had just so much upper body strength because I mean, like having to swing around a bar that you have to have a lot of upper body strength. So I was benching 135 within no time. And all my brother did when he went to the gym was bench because he he's a football player. So all of him and his friends, that's all they did. So that's all I did. And um, my bench just blew up. And I had a old bodybuilder guy come up to me and he was like, you should look into powerlifting. And at the time, I literally had no idea what powerlifting was. Oh. I didn't even I didn't even know there were, what bodybuilding was either like I was like oh people just go to the gym to be healthy you know like I didn't even know that it was a sport and then I looked into it and I found Vin and then I went to Vin's gym and at the time I was I like I looked up powerlifting and then I saw Steffi Cohen and I just started looking up to her so I remember the first thing I said to Vin when I walked in that gym was I'm gonna be the next Steffi Cohen that's what I <laughs> literally the first thing I said to him. And what did he say? <laughs> he still tells me to this day. He goes, I remember you saying that. And I remember in my head being like, well, I don't know about this one, but you know, we're going to give it a shot. Yeah. And so not even a year later, I was going to worlds. So it was um, definitely a long journey. And I had to go through like a lot at a young age to get to the point that I am now but honestly I wouldn't change any of it because it made me so mentally mature and yeah. it just it also shows me that like whenever I'm having a bad time or whenever like I have a bad month or a bad week I always remember in the back of my mind you got through the hardest two years of your life you made it through and you're doing better than you ever have before and you are in like such an amazing spot like you're gonna have ups and downs in life you're gonna have ups and downs in lifting but like I made it through like depression and uh, eating disorder at 15 years old and yeah. like I don't know it almost makes me have the confidence that I can get through anything so like yeah it was it sucked that I was so young and I had to go through all that but also I wouldn't change it because now I just I just can have the confidence to get through anything now. Yeah. Um, I, that's, that's an awesome story. And I want to ask you like some more like details about it, but like, just, um, off the top, it's like, you're, I think, you know, when you think about getting really strong, um, and, and having like a huge weapon, like your bench and, um, being, I think you'll find, and what people will see over time is that, it's your mental toughness. That is really like your huge weapon that you're going to have that is going to keep you in the game for a lot longer. The ability to be like a little bit more patient, have a longer term view of things, you know, like we'll talk about it. Like you're just aging up into the juniors. Right. So it's like going to be a mental battle of yeah. like going against people that are older than you and more established than you and stuff. And like how you're going to deal with uh, that adversity. Well, you've already gone through something way tougher than that. And like, you already have gone through a sport where there's a really long, time horizons, like four year plan for Olympics and stuff like that. Um, so I think that's going to end up being super huge for you. Um, but I also wanted to like, just kind of talk about like, how, ex how did you get over the eating disorder? Like, and do you think like, are you over a hundred percent or is it something that you always will kind of kind of like battle with or, or, or what's your take on that? That's actually a really good question. Um, I, I did it myself. Like I went to the therapist or whatever, but ultimately I honestly think they'll help you a little bit, but it has to be your decision to recover and like finally decide I want to do this for myself. I can't do this anymore. I can't 
be restricting. I can't feel like shit basically um, all the time anymore. Like I want to do better for myself. It has to be your decision. And like I said, lifting definitely helped. That's why I preach powerlifting so much because it's just that mindset shift with everything. Um, just shifting my mindset from, oh, I want the number on the scale to go down. It needs to go down to, oh, I want the number on my lifts to go up. It needs to go up. And in order mm-hmm. for it to go up, I need to eat. I need to fuel my body po- properly. Mm-hmm. Um, that helped me a lot to recover. Actually, I'd say about a year and a half ago, um, I was still struggling a little bit with restricting. And I told myself, I was like, you are, you're not counting calories. Six months, you're not counting a single calorie. You're not looking at the labels. You're not doing any of that. You're going to eat what you want. And if, if I'm craving ice cream at night, I'm going to eat ice cream. If I'm craving a donut after I eat that ice cream, I'm going to give my body what it wants for six months. And I did that. And it was really, really hard for me. Um, but it just built my relationship with food back up. And I started viewing fu- food as fuel, not as like something bad. And I also did like some research on nutrition because knowing more about food has also helped with that. Like mm-hmm. now I know like fast digesting carbs and like the slow digesting carbs to have before you lift and just knowing what I'm putting into my body is positively benefiting me has definitely helped. Um, I still struggle with it every single day. It's having an eating disorder is it never goes away. You just learn just like anxiety. Cause I feel like sometimes anxiety and eating disorders go hand in hand. Um, you just learn how to cope with it. You learn how to shift that mindset. I'll say that over and over again, because like mm-hmm. everything in life that I struggle with, I just, I got to, I have to figure out a way to like shift my mindset. And that's helped me get through those challenges, but mm-hmm. with the eating disorder, it never really goes away. You just learn what to say to yourself to almost reassure yourself. Like in relationships, you always have to re- reassure your partner when something's bothering them. But like, it's a relationship with yourself and with food. Like you're going through a bad day. You want to restrict, but there's certain things you can say to yourself that reassure yourself that like, everything's going to be okay. Having a cookie at a family dinner, having cake at a birthday party, like it's not going to affect anything. It's one day and just kind of, yeah, just viewing food as fuel and not something bad has really helped me. Like if I, cause something that I struggled with actually during the cut was I'd get a refeed day or I would get like a cheat meal and I'd be like, Oh, I don't need to have it. Like um, that's gonna, that's gonna make my weight go up or something like that. But what I did was I had that cheat meal and instead of viewing it as bad, I would do it before like a big squat day. So yeah, I would tell myself, you're using these carbs for good. You're using it to fuel your lift. And that has also really helped me. And also I had the cheat meal and then I recorded my weight the day before. And then I waited three days after and my weight was the exact same so Mm. knowing that and kind of knowing the facts behind everything um I don't know just has really helped me with my relationship and with food ultimately but it's taken me a long time definitely to get to this place with food and it's it's not going to happen overnight which I feel like a lot of people think it's going to happen really fast but um it's a work in progress every single day, just like powerlifting is you're constantly working towards a goal. And I'm just constantly working on bettering my relationship with food and how I view food, but it's definitely gotten a lot better over the past two years. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, again, it's like, it's amazing how powerlifting is like trains us for life in so many ways and how it's like so relatable to life um, in general, like whatever you're going through, like powerlifting in some ways offers answers Mm -hmm. Um, and helps you like shift your mindset around things. Um, did you start to see that shift happening just when you were going to the gym with your brother and stuff? Or like, when did you like, feel like you really kind of like had, had like, you know, got the upper hand on your eating disorder? Um, it was probably 
a month or two into powerlifting okay. because when I was going to the gym with my brother, I wasn't really training so much for strength. Okay. And when I started training for strength, it, it that's when like the mind shift, the mindset shift really happened mm -hmm. from like, I don't care about the weight on the scale anymore. I care about the weight I can move. And that's when I really think that I was like, I don't care about how much food I'm eating anymore. I don't care about how little food I'm eating anymore. I want to be strong. And that's when I really was like, I'm, I'm recovering from this mindset. I can't do this anymore. I want to be strong. I want to be the strongest in the world one day. So yeah, that that's probably when I really just the switch clicked in my brain. I gotcha. And who are the people that like kind of supported you through this process along the way? Like, I know like your mom is a big supporter, your brother, right? Yeah, my mom has just been wonderful. She drives me insane sometimes, but I I love her and I wouldn't. She's like my biggest supporter. She was there for me on days that I didn't want to eat. She'd like talk me through it. And um, she, I don't know, she's just anytime I need her, she's there. She's always, she always answers her phone right away. I text her. She's always answering her texts. I come up to her at home and she's always there to talk to me. Um, my dad is also a really big supporter and um, the light work and um, lifting the house that comes from him. Uh -huh. Every time that I would leave for powerlifting training, he'd be like, lift the house, sweetie, or something like that. <laughs> like it'll be a bench or a bench day and he'll be like bench the house and like that's where that comes from and actually people were making fun of me for saying that on tiktok they're like that's not a small house and i'm like guys it's literally what my dad says to me before yeah. i leave the house that's why i say it um and my brother too because he always he was a big part in why i'm so confident with being strong as a girl because he never looked down on me or frowned upon me for like wanting to lift heavy he was always super super supportive of me and me and him weren't really close two years ago but he went through some things of his own and he started going to the gym and me and him started going to the gym together and now we're like closer than we ever have been I consider him like one of my good friends now which is cool to think because not not even a few years ago we barely talked to each other and now he's like one of my good friends and we tell each other everything um he he supports everything that I do he'll always be reposting my reels and all that stuff and with the eating he he's never like made any comments about like anything like if I'm eating pizza if I'm eating wings or like anything like that he just is like a hundred percent supportive of what I'm doing and I couldn't ask for a better family support. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's obvious just like knowing you and talking to you that you come from like a really good family, you know, that raised you right. And instill good values in you. And, um, you're right. Your mom is in the, our DMS all the time. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> She's definitely your biggest fan out there. Uh, every time we repost you on the story, she always comments and is, like, is like, that's my girl. Exactly. She says it all the time. Even her Instagram handle is like mom and your, mom your 2004, 2000. <laughs> yeah. So it's super, super cool. Um, and then what, how is your brother? Is he older brother or younger brother? He's younger. Everybody thinks he's older because he's taller than me, but okay. he's, he just turned 17. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I had a sister that was super into gymnastics and when you're young and your sister is like, all the attention is on, is on her f through gymnastics because they start at such a young age and the training is so long. He mm -hmm. probably at some point felt like, you know, he was like taking a back seat because like your yeah. career and your gymnastics was like, everything the whole family would be focused on all the time. So I could kind of see that. And then, and then it's kind of interesting that it kind of flipped where then now he's the one who got you into the gym, yeah. you know, and then now you're like this big gym powerlifting star and everything. So it's really cool that he can kind of play a little bit more of a role. Maybe he feels more like he's got a, he's got a part to play in that. Yeah. And, and he loves all the free stuff that I get. So <laughs> that all goes to him. So I'm sure he loves all that. <laughs> Uh, and one last question about your backstory. When you said like you, you, someone like told, told you in the gym, like, I think it's so cool. So cool like we that. talked to so many different 
powerlifters and and everyone kind of has this similar story of like this if it wasn't for this one guy that like told me to start doing powerlifting I would have never done it and yeah. it's like we wouldn't have had a world champion you know um like even Meg Scanlon like she was in the sport and then was gonna quit after having kids and stuff and if it wasn't for her coach you know then then she would have left and we wouldn't have had the world champion last year um and so it's really cool like whoever that guy is like hats off to him that told you to start powerlifting some old bodybuilder as you described him <laughs> oh, yeah. i but, mean there, there's a few like yeah. old guys that i could just have a place in my heart at crunch since i was yeah. super young who who are always coming up to me and be like um do you need a spot on bench like even them just asking to spot me and then being like oh my gosh you're so strong you're crazy strong for a girl and just yeah there's a bunch of them that are at crunch that are just were really supportive of me. So yeah. And the, the big body builder guy who told me that I, he, he first told me I should body build. And then yeah. I was like, I'm not bodybuilding. And then he was like, all right, then, then you should look into powerlifting. <laughs> okay, nice. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad you decided not to do powerlifting and then you said, or not to do bodybuilding. And then you said like you researched it and you found Vin. How did that, how did that happen? Um, and tell us who Vin is. Vin is my coach, my wonderful, wonderful coach. Yeah. <laughs> Don't take away my accessories, Vin. I know you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I just looked up like powerlifting around my area and there was two gyms that popped up and Vin just happened to be the first one that we called and he just told us to come in and see the gym and my mom came with me and uh, just went and saw the gym. And at that time I was benching like 195. And I told Vin that and he didn't believe me. So he made me bench 195 and I did at the gym. And then he was like, he thought it was crazy. Cause I was also benching um, like football style, like close grip, like yeah. no arch, nothing, no yeah. leg drive. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's how I met him. It was just looked it up online and he was the first one. Wow. What a story. Yeah, Thank made you for each other. I, I, we were made for each other. So a hundred percent. You have such a great relationship and he's been like such a great mentor for you. And obviously he's a, a fantastic coach. Like he's helped bring you up, you know, from the ground up, like where you weren't even squatting and, and deadlifting or doing anything like that. And, yeah. and, and I mean, as good as your bench is, you know, squat and be, squat and deadlift are the most important lifts in terms of building yeah. a total. So, um, he's really brought you along in a, in a lot of ways, um, on that. And obviously it's a testament to your hard work too, but it takes a team like your mom, like you said, drive you over there and Vin's yeah. there. And he answered the phone. Thank God he didn't just like, like just, you know, yeah. send it to voicemail. Right. I mean, geez, you'd be totally different. You'd be training at some other gym. Um, yeah. and who knows what, but, um, what a great story. Like, it's just crazy how there's like these, all these little things, these little forks in the road where it's like, you could have gone one way or another way and your whole path changed, you know, by meeting Vin and then, you know, getting into Vin, bringing you into powerlifting America. And then next thing you know, you're going to worlds. Um, so it's a very cool story, very heartwarming, and um, we're all rooting for you. So let's talk about, and Julia, do you have any questions related to that? Otherwise, I want to transition into um, just talking about your powerlifting, you know, um, get into some numbers a little bit. Um, so 2022, it was a really good year for you. You won the national championship, sub-junior, 69 kilo weight class, went to the world championships in Turkey, broke the bench press world record, um, and then you finished with a silver medal. So, um, up to that point, um, you had really only like before, before nationals in Orlando, you'd only done one meet. Is that right? Yeah. I yeah, did. So yeah. So, so going into Orlando for nationals, um, what did you think of it? Like, how are you wrapping your head around it? Like, like, Oh my God, like I did one meet and then now I'm at nationals. I was a nervous wreck. Honestly, the night before I remember I, I couldn't even eat. That's how nervous I was. I was sitting in my hotel room with Vin and my parents and I was bawling my eyes out. Literally. I was like, I don't belong here. I don't deserve to be here. Like saying all those things. I was like, I'm not strong enough to be here and kind of just freaking out the night before. And, um, I think I, I actually, called Haley who's the, the one girl that um is at my home gym and she was kind of like I'm proud of you no matter what you're gonna do great it doesn't matter how much you're lifting like you're here and you work super hard and you are just going to do great and then I competed I actually 
technically was not the favorite going in at all. I was, yeah, there was only one other girl that I was competing against, but like her training total was more than mine. And like going in, I was pretty nervous and she bombed out on squats. So technically I, if she got, if she squatted, like who knows what would have happened. I just executed all my lifts. I went nine for nine and she bombed out on squat and um, I was able to finish nationals with less stress because I already knew that technically I won. So it was kind of, it was a weight lifted off of me. Yeah, I was able to have fun and really focus on my lifts and how I executed and not have to really worry about um, competing against somebody. Uh, it was, and I, I broke the national record on bench, which was really cool. Cause that was like the first, first official record or something that I broke at a uh-huh. meet. Um, but yeah, going into it, I was a nervous wreck, which I always get nervous before I compete. Um, like in gymnastics, you got nervous before you compete too. Yeah. Yeah. But I always like, but then I lock in like the second that I'm on the platform, like it's a whole different mindset, but, um, before that I was absolutely so nervous, but nationals was really fun last year. Um, it was definitely a really good experience and, I mean, I was nervous and said I didn't deserve being there. And then I walked away being the national champion and um, making the world's team. So it's kind of funny to think back on it because I was literally, yeah. like, I don't deserve to be here. And then I won. So, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's so crazy that, I mean, I didn't know that. I didn't know you were crying and, and uh, stressing yeah. out the night before. Every time I saw you around the venue, you were upbeat and you were, you were super, you know, um, positive and you look like you had your game face on and you were like ready to roll and had a good time. And it, yeah, I didn't think it hit until like when I was in my hotel room and I was like, yeah. Oh, this is real. Like I compete tomorrow. And like, I don't know, but like, yeah, during the day and stuff, I was chill and I was having so much fun, but then like, I just was like, oh boy, tomorrow's, tomorrow's the day. And this used to happen to me all the time with gymnastics too. Like it would always be the night of, I would just freak out. I wouldn't be able to sleep. I'd just be thinking about it. Not in like a bad freaking out way, just like almost excited, but excited. Also nervous. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, I know that it's like, it's like the night before Christmas when you're a kid or something like you're just yeah. like super excited about like what's going to happen. Um, yeah. I'm the same way. And, um, and I resort to like, taking like sleeping medication and stuff oh, yeah. like that. I do that too. Now I take Advil yeah. PM the night yeah. before I, that's the only thing that will like knock me out. And I also know I need to get a good night's sleep to compete well. So like, that's another stressor. It's like, Oh, I'm, I'm freaking out about this, yeah. sleep, but I also need, need sleep. So. Yeah. So now that becomes your worry. Like shit, now I'm yeah. not sleeping. Oh my goodness. Yeah. But yeah, I mean like even, even in the warmups, like even at, right after weigh-ins you're in the warmup room you're hanging out with like Carolyn Connor and just like having a good old time. And like, I'm, I'm telling you, like, if, if you, if you were nervous, um, there might've been one time, I think like before squats started where you might've said something to me, like uh, you're, you're nervous or you felt nervous or something, but like, you really didn't show it. Like you were, you were really like owning the space. Like you, you felt, you seemed like a pro, like you seemed like you knew what you were doing. I mean, I think part of that might've been Vin being there and like, Cause he's such an experienced coach and like keeping you on track and keeping getting you warmed up. Right. And everything like that. But, um, you hid your emotions very well. That's for sure. Yeah. And, um, so yeah, so you did, you did great. You won. Um, yeah. Brianna Jordan is the woman that we're talking about that bombed out on squats. Um, felt bad for her because she yeah. her squat is her weapon. And, um, you know, you actually, um, out benched her and, um, I think, came real close to similar. You guys had very similar numbers, um, on deadlift and everything like that, but you're right. Like she was a formidable opponent. She was the favorite and it just goes to show you never know what's going to happen until you show up, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, and like, like we talk, we, uh, I've been mentioning Meg Scanlon a a lot. Like I'm a huge fan of hers, obviously. And, um, you know, she, uh, same thing last year at worlds, she showed up, Leah didn't make weight and Meg Scanlon won the world championship. And a lot of people didn't even predict her to be on the podium. You know, they were thinking that she was going to finish in, in, in at best third place, something like this. And you, you just never know what happened, what's going to happen. So you have to just show up and go through and gut it out 
And next thing you know, you're on a plane to Turkey, um, uh, headed to the world championships. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. So tell us about that. So how was the trip to Turkey? Um, yeah. And, and just, you know, like, had you ever been out of the country before? No, well, to Canada, but I mean, it's, I feel like that doesn't really count. Well, especially cause it's like 15 minutes from Buffalo, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was crazy. The experience was really good. Uh, there was like, it was cool to see like, there was dogs in the middle of the street. Like there was stray dogs. You'd walk yeah. down the middle of the street and there was just a bunch of stray dogs. It was just so cool. And the food was good. The food was very like, very lean, very healthy. I lost seven pounds while I was there, like unintentionally wow. because the food was so lean and, and different. Um, yeah, I was really, it was a really good experience. I had a lot of fun with my coach and then uh, another teammate that came with us. And, uh, I actually wasn't really nervous for like the World. competition. Yeah. yeah. World. I wasn't really that nervous, which kind of surprised me and scared me that I wasn't really nervous. Cause I was like in the warm up room and I was like, Vin, I'm ready. I'm not even nervous right now. I'm ready. And, um, <laughs> yeah then it was super hot there though i remember that it was like they had no ac in the hotel so we were just like sweating all the time and we were just like super super hot that's probably why i lost seven pounds also because there was no ac but um yeah and it was it was hard to find like gatorade or powerade they didn't have any of that so like the usual that i would have before the meat like i had to eat just bread that's what they had to refuel yourself. So I was just Mm. eating bread. And um, I remember squats, the first squat, I'm usually super, super nervous before the squat, but I was just so locked in and focused that I wasn't even nervous. And I walked out there and it was just the crowd and all the different countries were just cheering for everybody. It doesn't, didn't matter where you were from. Just everybody was cheering for everybody. And it was so cool. Um, so squats went really good. I went three for three on squats. I hit a platform PR. I think it was like three Oh three. And mm-hmm. then 37.5. Yeah. Three Oh three. Yep. Yeah. Which now that's, that's crazy to think about. Now that's like easy for me, but yeah, that, that was, um, that was a PR and then it was bench big to break time. that it's big to break that 300 pound barrier for yeah. the first time. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And then I broke the world record on my opening bench and then she broke it and then I broke it again. And then yeah. she jumped up. Like, I don't remember. She took like a big jump and then she fouled it. And then yeah. I went up, which when I broke the world record the second time, it was a grinder. Like yeah. 226 is usually easy for me. And it was, it was difficult. Like I got, I I had to grind it out and I didn't have much left. So we went up, but I failed my last attempt. And then she had another chance to go for it and she failed. So then I got the world record and yeah. that was just, that was super exciting and it was a great a gold battle. medal. Yeah. It was a really good ba- battle though. Everybody, like everybody was just screaming when both of us went like for each of us, it was, it was super cool. Like I've never had an experience like that before. Uh, and then deadlifts, I was dead. Like I hadn't, I told Ben, I was like, I don't know how much I have left. So uh, I popped some pre-workout, you know, and then, um, oh. Vin did the massage gun on my back and I pulled, I think 335, which also was a platform PR for me. It might've been 330. Um, but I just pulled for yeah, 336, 336. 336 yeah. yeah. Uh, I pulled for second place cause I knew I wasn't going to be able to pull for the win. Um, it just, her deadlift was insane. So I just, I didn't want to hurt myself or like I was already gassed. So we yeah. just pulled for silver. Um, cause we just wanted to get the best placing that we could for team USA. And that was going to be second. And yeah, I pulled that. And then they announced like 
during awards, I remember they announced like new world record holder. And then I got to go up there and that was just, that was super cool. So that's and amazing. I had, I had um, two people there recognize me from TikTok and I wasn't even big on TikTok then. I think I had like 77 K, which is like, it's, it's still like a decent amount yeah. of following, but like, it wasn't like big, like I am now. And I had a few people recognize me. So I thought that was super cool. And I met Gavin. Gavin so, and Ryan. And right? you, yeah. And Ryan. Yeah. Yeah. I remember all the pictures coming out. I loved it. Um, I love, I remember they were talking about you on the, uh, on the live stream and they were like trying to remember what your Instagram handle was. And I was like, DM them like, here's her Instagram handle. Like say it right, you know, and stuff like this. And, um, just, just, it was, it was so cool to see that you had such a fun time. Like you said, um, it was obvious with like all the other stuff that you were posting, like the pictures flexing on, on Ryan out angling him and like all this kind of stuff, like and a bunch of new people also, like even from team USA, I'm, I met, um, Zach Taylor, uh, Caden, like I met a bunch of people and made a bunch of friends, which was really cool. And uh, I also met this one girl from Um, Czechoslovakia. Okay. And me and her still DM all the time. And we're like, oh, I I hope I see you at like a world meet in the future because we're like friends now. And I repost her stuff and she reposts my stuff. And she's just like the sweetest person. So it's really cool that like now I have a friend across the world. Yeah. Yeah. What what a sport, right? I mean, what a world championships too. Like it's not like a world championships where there's only like two countries there. It's like there's people from all over. There's like, you know, I think 60, 70 countries involved in these. Um, and there's, there's over a hundred countries in the IPF, but like of the teams that actually go to worlds, it's like 60, something like that. Really cool. Um, just on the numbers real quick. I mean, um, this bench battle was a really cool thing because you open with a world record at 96 and then she goes and does 100 kilos. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you, you go and you basically take the chip on that. You go one Oh one. And I mean, you know, and, uh, she tries to do a very big jump to go to one from 100 to 105, yeah. um, which we all know on bench five kilos, especially in 69, you know, one of the lighter weight class or in middle, middle weight classes. And then also for sub juniors, um, and women, it's like, that is definitely, you know, a five kilo jump is a big deal. So you have to be super confident in that. And it's interesting because strategy wise, it's kind of a really bad strategy to take a whole number like that. 100, like open, you know, like, so you do 96, like she probably should have done like 96.5 or 98 or something like another one of these chip numbers, like not a two and a half kilo increment. And then, you know, to, for her to go up to 105 after you did 101, she should have just done 101.5. You know what I mean? Secured the, the world record. And then, on your thirds, you guys could go up again, you know, and do whatever, but she be by do, going up and doing that one Oh five on her second, that locked her in. And, and since she missed that, she couldn't, she couldn't go back down and try to chip the world record anymore or anything like that. So she missed it twice. And that, you know, you walk away with you see, this is where having Vin there and, you know, she does 100, you did the smart move one Oh one, right. Secure the world record and and then see what happens on thirds if you're gonna like want to go up or whatever. But anyway, it's just like a, a a good sign of like you had you had like a, a game day coaching wizard behind yeah. you, and it looks like from these numbers from the attempts that she was attempting, um, she didn't. You know um, that their coach didn't make the right didn't put in the right numbers for her, and it made a big difference. Um, and so that's one thing we talk about on the podcast a lot is like attempt selection and making smart plays and stuff like this. And then in the end, you ended up winning silver by just barely, you know, two and a half, three and a half kilos. So like you couldn't afford to miss lifts, mm-hmm. and you went eight for nine. And, um, all the competitors around you went like seven for nine, six for nine, you know, and that's what, and it also enabled you to have such success and get that gold medal because like this, the girl that finished in third, uh, yeah, she missed three lifts. So she, she went six for nine and mm-hmm. barely missed three and a half kilos behind you taking five kilo jumps here and there. Um, and where she just would have taken two and a half kilo jumps on a couple of things, she might've been able to take that podium spot for you. So it's a real Testament to, I think Vin was handling you, right? Like he was the one putting in your numbers and stuff like that. And the team USA coaching staff, like putting in the right strategy, um, and, you know, securing the highest possible podium spot, like you said, for team USA, 
getting that silver medal. Um, so that was, that was really cool to see it all play out. And I know you're historically, you don't really miss a lot of lifts and Vin Vin's lifters in general go nine for nine, almost all the time, nine for nine or eight for nine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was the first competition that I missed any lifts at. And I think it was mostly because I did lose seven pounds and I think that kind of took a hit on my bench. Um, Mm -hmm. Even with the January meet, I missed my last deadlift, which now is like rep weight for me. And it's not even a few months later. I think I had to cut four pounds the morning of January meet. And again, I I think it just like affected deadlifts that day. Um, But when I'm like, when I don't have to cut weight and when I'm like at a good weight, my normal weight, I usually go for nine for nine, like at nationals and my other meet. Um, because yeah. Vin is very smart with his uh, attempt selection and he never puts anything on the bar that he knows that I can't handle. So. For sure. For sure. And as you start to get into these battles, like we'll talk about, like you got a battle uh, on your hands coming up at yeah. nationals. Um, when it gets time to do these battles, I mean, it's, it's understandable that maybe you load something on the bar for the final deadlift for placing or to finish, you know, to try to knock off someone off the podium or for the win. And maybe you make it, maybe you don't, you know, but it's like, you got to load it up for the win or you got to load it up for that podium spot or whatever it is. But yeah, like at the previous meets, when you're not having that kind of competition behind you, like when Brianna Jordan bombed out and stuff, it's a lot easier to cruise and just put numbers on the bar that, that you can definitely hit and go nine for nine. So it's cool. You got your first taste of that kind of like head to head battle, like three-way battle really where you're battling for first, but then you also got to watch out for the person in third coming up from behind um, you kind of got that, like in just your third meet at, and at, on the world stage at IPF worlds. Yeah. I mean, this, this is like a little thing you file away of like another, like little experience where you're talking before about how you use your experiences to draw strength. Like this is another one where it's like, now you have that experience that you can draw. And so when you go to nationals, for instance, coming up in Scottsdale, there's lifters there that don't have that experience you know, that haven't had these battles, especially like on a world stage, like you have. So it's something that's going to play to your advantage, you know, no matter what the outcome is. Um, but yeah, what, what was the like vibe like of the team? Like you already mentioned that you kind of already had some, made some friends on the team and stuff like that. And then also what was it like, like just putting on the USA singlet and like being there, like representing, you know, the United States of America, your country and all that. How did that Uh, feel? It felt surreal. Like I always dreamed of being on the Olympic team for gymnastics. And obviously it's a little different, but like it was always, I guess, a dream of mine to represent Team USA. So doing it for a different sport, like I still, it was crazy to me. And it was just like one of my dreams come true. Um, I felt so honored wearing it. And it was a, it was a dope singlet too. Like it was cool. It <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. I it's just, like a badge of honor. Those singlets are, everyone loves them. Yeah. It's really cool. And the whole team, it was, it was such a great experience. Everybody was so supportive. I remember, I think her name's Alex. She was the equip equipped world champion. Alex she, Chavez. Yeah. yeah. She was there and she helped me. She talked to me before weigh-ins and she was amazing. Um, everybody else on the team, like everybody watched everybody compete. Uh, we didn't even know each other really because most of us were from different States. Um, and everybody made sure that they were going to everybody's meet to support them and cheer for them. It was just, mm-hmm. It was like we became family in the matter of a few days and became like a really an actual team in the matter of a few days. Um, And then there was a banquet, too, and we all got to party and celebrate after at the banquet. And yeah, now I just I have some lifelong friends, I think, from that. So it was really great. Yeah. And I think the only thing now left is for you to, you know, win and have them play the national anthem, you know, but you got to see some other people win and have them play the national anthem and like, just had to be like, so cool. It's like, yeah, like you said, was, surreal. It was really cool. Yeah. And I mean, it, awesome too, that you had Vin with you, like not a lot of people, um, a lot of people there were just kind of 
on their own. Like they didn't have a Vin, you know, their personal coach with them like that. Yeah. yeah. It was cool that he was able to come because there was like a few girls. I remember that they were at nationals and their coach was with them at nationals, but then he couldn't come to uh, worlds and they had to basically coach themselves. I mean, there was the head coach of the USA team, but yeah, that's not your coach that you usually work with on a daily basis. It's so much different, I guess. So, and they're there for everybody. They're not like your, it's not, you kind of have like that the safety blanket, safety mustache. Yeah. Yeah, Safety (laughs) mustache. (laughs) um whereas some of the other lifters you know they they have yeah the head coach but they just met him like for the first time in person like that day or the day before so yeah so that's cool I mean that you're I mean that shows you too like the kind of dedication that Vin has to his athletes that like oh you made the world team well we're going to worlds then he's going with you know he's not just going to send you over there with someone um he's going to be there and he's part of the team and he did such a good job handling you Clark you guys I think between you might have missed like two lifts or something like that um and then you know and then he handled a bunch of other lifters as well on the raw side um put in their numbers and and did their game day coaching there he did such a good job that you know John Burford invited him in to be uh one you know the basically the head coach of the raw team for the juniors Yeah, yeah yeah they're calling him they're calling him the uh raw coordinator or the classic you know we saw we don't use the word raw we use a classic uh coordinator and um it's kind of like the offensive coordinator of 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 the the juniors team so it's super cool and i mean it's just again shows like man you you when you made that phone call to kenmore barbell and like you got him on the phone and then you came in and met him like wow wow, like you lucked out big time you found a good one Mm -hmm. so um all right so let's fast forward then to the winter classic um, so you put on a show at this competition. I was there. Um, it was awesome. Uh, I was filming you and everything like that. It was, it was amazing. You were put on a show in the warm up room. You're like the star of Buffalo. Um, but you had some other stars there. Anthony McNaughton came in. Um, he was on the world's team, finished a silver medal at worlds as well. Like a super stud. We had Audrey came in as well. Like she's got a ton of following and she's super strong and she's pretty new into the sport as well. And then I think, was Haley, I'm not sure if Haley or Megan was lifting or not, but I know they were there supporting you. Um, uh, they, they, they didn't lift at that one, but they Meg, lifted the previous, yeah, yeah Meg was, and they were there supporting, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it was kind of a stacked, uh, it was uh, definitely a stacked competition, um, for when we're talking about like Shane Nutt was there coaching, yeah. um, some of his athletes and he was, he was on, made that same trip to Turkey with you guys yeah. as well. Um, so it was like, it felt like, there was a lot of stars in the room. There. Clark didn't compete, but like he was yeah. there too. So yeah. we, we yeah. were all there. So yeah, there was like there, yeah. So between um the those, there was like at least like four people that had been on the world's team that were in the room, at least. Yeah. Um, but you definitely were like the queen of the show. Uh, it was your home turf. It was like playing a home game in front of the home fans. Um, and you put on a show for sure, and you stood out amongst all this stacked talent and everything like this. So just tell us a little bit about the meet, like what you, this was your first competition as a 63. Um, it was, what was the reason like why you did the meet? Like, was it to test the 63 waters and see how things were going to go? And, and then how was the cut and everything, um, going into that? Uh, yeah, we did that meet basically just to see how I competed as a 63. It was kind of going to be like the determining factor if I stayed as a 63 or moved up. Um, but so the week prior, we did a gut cut, which did not work at all. Um, you just my, tested it? Yeah. April and Vin, or April's my nutritionist. Her and Vin didn't want me water cutting just because I had been actually cutting for the last like few months. And they thought it would just, it would absolutely just destroy me. So they wanted to try a gut cut because that's not as intense and just didn't end up working. So I woke up the morning of 142.8 eight I think which is like is that that's four pounds over I think yeah yeah or more maybe and I because you ended up weighing 138 in the end I um went in the bath I woke up at 4 30 to check my weight went in the bath like three different times to try and just sweat out some weight that wasn't working. So I went to the gym, uh, got checked in. Then I spit in a cup 
for about two hours. Yeah. And then I weighed in and I made weight. Um, but I was just tired and kind of not feeling myself. So I tried my best to replenish everything, drunk, drank a lot of electrolytes, a lot of water, a lot of Gatorade, um, had some carbs, just tried to refuel as best as I could. Yeah. And, um, yeah, then I squatted 314 in competition, which has been a really big mental barrier for me on squats yeah. and just breaking that number in competition was just really like a confidence booster to me, especially being a weight class lower. Um, and it moved really well too. It moved better than I expected. Yeah. But you smoked it. I did that, which was a platform PR and then bench yeah. actually before I was benching, my lat was, um, cramping up. So during the whole entire bench warm up, I didn't, I was not feeling like myself cause my whole back was just like mm -hmm. super cramped up. But, um, then I benched 232, which is also a platform PR. And Gunthor made me pause that for, for a good amount of time, which I like, I like Gunther as a head ref because personally, since I compete at like higher levels, I know that like I'm getting the right commands and like mm -hmm. that's how it's going to be at nationals. So I know a lot of people were giving him shit about his commands and stuff, but I actually prefer that he – he is so strict with it and he actually follows the rules that judges should follow because um i don't know it just prepares me better for yeah. competitions like that's, nationals that's a huge that's a champion mindset right there like you want it to be harder at your local meet than it than it's going to be so that it prepares you you don't want to just get away with easy you know touch and go bench presses and stuff yeah. like that and he is hardcore he's extremely yeah. hardcore but and he's young fair. Yeah. And I, but I think it's very fair. Like yeah. I thought all his pauses were very fair and totally. uh, yeah, all his calls were good in my opinion, or from what I saw mm -hmm. and I had deadlift and this is what usually happens to me is I have like nothing left for deadlifts, especially with having to cut four pounds in the morning. Um, so deadlifts were not moving how they usually would move. And by my third attempt, I was just gassed but wanted to give it the best that I could so we went for 363 which is what I hit at my top end of prep the end of prep and um it did not even get off the ground so but then I kind of just laughed it off because I mean it was a local meet and it was my first meet as a 63 and I was just having fun so I was like you know yeah. what we're just gonna use this as motivation in the future um but yeah, it was, it was overall a pretty good meet, I'd say, for 63s. And I was significantly stronger than I was as 69, as a 63 at that meet. So and then me and Vin talked it over and we're like, yep, we're staying in this weight class because you have not only been getting stronger, but you compete like the same that you competed as a 69, as a 63. And right now it is kind of a little bit of an advantage for the time being, being mm -hmm. a little lighter. So, yeah, I mean, it was only like four to five months after Turkey and, yeah. you know, you put like 14 kilos on your total, which is awesome. And I mean, you definitely could have taken a couple kilos less, maybe on the deadlift on the final yeah. and added a couple more kilos to your total there. Um, but like you said, it was a fun, it was a fun attempt. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about your battles with 315 on squat. Oh my gosh. That weight is just, I, the first time that I went for it was, I think it was the end of Turkey prep or world prep. I failed not miserably, but like I got to my sticking point and I failed. So I was really mad about that. Um, and then I went for it again, a few months after worlds three times same day three times I went for it and I like almost got it the last time and just failed it and I have those three videos still of me failing it and just being so mad at myself yeah. and then I went for it again one time and I failed it again and then I remember the first time that I ever hit it I was with Clark and Gabby at Jada and it moved so good like yeah. I I, and then I, and then I hit 325 right after 
Like yep. I went up and then I hit 325, which this usually happens with my squat. Squat is, I love to say this, squat is my favorite lift to fail. Fail it all the time. Um, but <laughs> I'll fail a weight and then like a few months later, it will just go up so easy and then I'll hit another PR. And that's usually how my squats go. But yeah, it was just after failing it so many times, it was definitely kind of a mental thing. And um, I've hit it probably a decent handful of times now so I'm definitely more confident with it but it was definitely like a mental barrier to get over for sure and I mean to do it on the platform that's kind of the key thing is like you had done it in the gym then and then but then to like solidify it put it on your open powerlifting that you can hit it um and then now you know going above and beyond like what are you squatting now in pounds uh, 342 pounds, so. 342. So yeah. we're talking like not a, just a handful of months later, um, yeah. and you're blowing way past that. So now, like you said, are you doing triples with 315? What are you doing with 315? Actually next week, I'm supposed to have a triple with 315. Um, so we'll see how that goes. I'm pretty excited for that. I'm literally more excited to do that than I am my top single. So <laughs> yeah. Cause that, that weight was just your nemesis for so long. I think you've said after the meet, you're like, I own you now 315. Yeah, I, I, own you I, <laughs> That's like I love the that of one of my reels. I think. Yeah. I remember that. That was awesome. And you're, you know, it's cool to have that. Like, again, it's like one of those struggle things where it's like next, the, whatever the next number is four Oh five um, or whatever it is, you know, you'll be able to remember back of like, okay, it's okay. If I miss it a couple of times, you know, it's okay. Before you know it, I'm going to break four Oh five and I'm going to be doing four twenty five and up and up and up from there. So, um, so, all right, let's, um, that was, that was an awesome meet. Um, and so tell us who is April Smith. Yeah. You're talking about cutting. Uh, she's my, yeah, she got me through the first, part of the cut which I think it was like three and a half months and then we reversed and then I've been cutting for another three months I'm still cut I'm on my last week of the cut actually um and she got me through that as well um and yeah she just she does my nutrition nutrition online she's actually coming to Arizona to watch me compete which is gonna be I know yeah. She's so, a friend of mine from back in the day. Um, like that's actually how I met Vin. Uh, she was coaching, Vin was coaching her and Vin came out here to Boise and, uh, her and I were friends and lifted together and stuff. And, um, so it's a, such a small world, you know, like this connection between Buffalo and Boise that we have. And I'm super pumped to have like someone in, in Boise, who's like making a name for herself as well on the national stage by coaching someone like yourself and, uh, coming out to, Scottsdale is going to be fun uh, for her to be there and to see like the national platform and everything like that as well. She's a competitor as well. Um, she's a really strong lifter herself, but what, when you guys do nutrition, what style is it? Is it macros? Is it, does she just give you like a recipe that you need to make this chicken dish or something? Or like, how did, how does she, um, work with you on that stuff? So it's macros because I think actually, um, you, you can't, they can't give out meal plans unless you're a registered dietitian. Um, oh. so I get macros and, um, yeah, I just get them updated every week, depending on how my weight is. They might stay the same for a week. They might like decrease a little bit, but yeah, I've been doing macros for the majority of my cut. We started off a little bit with like, um, her giving me suggestions for meals of mm-hmm. like, kind of like when I was in a maintenance phase, just so I could uh, get the hang of like tracking my food more, but, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, we do macros. And so, and you were saying before that you were doing like a a cut and then you were doing a reverse, meaning that you're eating more calories. Like you're, you were in a calorie deficit Mm -hmm. for a while, three months, I think you said, and then going into the meat, you're in a calorie surplus. Is that the case or no? So a reverse is like, you just graduate. So you're in the cut, you gradually reverse back up to maintenance calories so like every week I would go up like 20 or 50 calories um up until the meat okay gotcha like so you can't really go from like being in such a low deficit to going right back up to your maintenance because your maintenance technically is not your maintenance anymore because your body had to adapt so it's your maintenance is lower so you're basically just reversing and building up your metabolism and, um, getting back to your body's normal maintenance calories. 
Okay. That's cool. Yeah. I don't know anything. I don't, I, I'm like a small boy. I'm only trying to like eat and, and eat everything. So uh, it's, it's interesting for me to hear about this kind of stuff and learn about it, but how was it, how did April um, approach, like knowing your background with your eating disorder and stuff like this, like, you know, this is like a whole thing of like, could be triggering to like be counting calories and like weighing yourself all the time and this kind of thing. So like how, you know, how did she um, play a role in kind of like, you know, approaching this in a, in a delicate way? So I told her about like my eating disorder past and stuff. And she just told me like, if weighing yourself this many times a week is not good for you, let me know. Uh, we don't have to weigh like we do three times a week and she was like if you mm -hmm. if that makes you uncomfortable we can only do like one time a week or two times a week or if you're having a bad body image day and you don't want to weigh yourself we can change the weigh in days like she's just very um flexible with that stuff and if i i could always like text her saying like i'm having a a bad day with food I want to restrict or something like that and then she just kind of talked me through it um and yeah it's been really good she's very understanding of that aspect of it I guess yeah. and another thing I made sure that I was in a good place with food before I decided to cut mm -hmm. um I built up my relationship with food and that's kind of why I decided to cut because um I was just in a really good place with food and yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, she's such a good person and such a nice person and so smart about what she does. Um, you found a, you found a really good nutrition coach there, you know, because she's got a very delicate touch and, and just being, I think, you know, just being a genuinely good person and caring about your clients and stuff and like knowing your background and being sensitive and aware of that is, is huge, you know, because some, some online, you know, coach or whatever, they don't have any kind of relationship or, or really know that much about their athletes or their, their customers. Mm, yeah. So it's cool. Yeah. April's awesome. I love her. So, all right, let's, um, talk briefly. We'll talk about a little preview of nationals coming up and then I'll hit you with some quick hitters and we'll wrap this up. Thank you so much for taking the time. Like this has been a really awesome episode. Um, so let's look ahead to the battle of the 63s and the juniors that are coming up. Um, like when you decided to go 63, you probably didn't foresee that there was going to be this much challenge for you waiting on the wings um, here at nationals. So you're going to be one of the youngest in the class because you just aged out of sub juniors um, this last I year. The, yeah. Yeah. I think I am the youngest. Um, yeah. Yeah. So mentally, how are you approaching it? Um, because that can be difficult. You're on top, like we're talking about the university athlete that's in college and then they're on top of the world and then they don't get drafted. And like now they're at the bottom of the totem pole again in, in society. And it's like, you're at the top of the world, you're at worlds, you won a national championship. And then now you're like, you know, coming in, I don't know where your nomination, Julia, do you know, I think you're like nominated like second or third or something or. Yeah. So you're nominated with, um, a 405 kilo total, which, um, I know you you've hit some massive PRs, so that's nowhere close to what you're capable of. Um, it looks like Daisy, um, is nominated first with a, a 442.5. And then Sophia is right behind you with a 402.5. And then we have Tiara at 390. So you guys are all really in there. I know, um, yeah. Not just you, uh, a few of them hit some massive PRs. So it's going to be, it's going to be pretty interesting. Is there anyone you're, you're specifically, you know, watching or anything like that? So I don't watch any of them. Just, uh -oh. uh, <laughs> Did we mess you up by telling you this? I hope no, not. No, I knew, like, I yeah. just, I don't, I know some of them follow me, but personally, I don't want to follow my competition just because I'll get in my head. Um, I like to focus on me and how I'm doing and how I'm performing because when you're focusing so much on somebody else, um, you kind of lose sight of why you're doing it. I feel like I'm doing it for myself and working hard for myself. So um, I know, I think Daisy follows me and I saw that and I've seen her numbers and me and Vin have talked about her and it's definitely going to be like a hard battle like last year too. I feel like it's last year repeated all over again. Um, yeah. cause I feel like I was in the same situation, uh, nominated second or third and like, 
it's just I'm not the top dog right now I'm not like yeah. the favorite which um honestly I love it because it makes me work harder and it gives me like something to laser focus on and just really push myself harder towards uh mm -hmm. but yeah I am young and I also know that like in the future years, I'm going to have time to grow as a junior. So I'm not trying to focus as much on winning, but as much at, I'm trying to focus on giving the best performance that I can and hitting all my numbers, going nine for nine, hitting a big total, um, executing everything well, making weight, um, just mm -hmm. focusing on refueling myself and honestly just having fun and enjoying the process because I know um, it's going to be hard for me as a first year junior to win, but um, it's not impossible. And that's why I'm just like been grinding in the gym and just focusing on my own lane. Um, I know that there's like some sharp shooters in the 63, you know, but yeah. um, I have confidence that me and Vin are going to put together a very big total and um I just got to focus on me and making my lifts and I've I've struggled with that in the past and Vin has really helped me just be able to focus on myself when it comes to like being in these situations even at yeah. worlds like he he's like do not look at the board do mm -hmm. not look at what they total don't watch them you need to focus on you you need to focus on working at, or making your lifts and whatever happens happens you just have to know that you're giving it everything you have and that you worked hard to get here and you've done everything that you could do to be at the posi position that you're at yeah and like you said you've been there before you weren't nominated first last year and you came away yeah. with the title so i love like your attitude like again like those what you just said right there like you would expect those kind of words from like a, a serious veteran in the game. Like, like, honestly, you remind me a lot of Meg Scanlon. Like she, like if you go and listen, to, listen to her episode that we did and you'll hear a lot of this like mental toughness type of uh, talk and like just having a good mindset going into the game day and um, you know, just being positive. And like you said, focusing on what you can control and um, and you never know who knows where the chips are going to fall. You know, like we didn't know last year what would happen and, and same thing here. Yeah. I mean, I do have a lot of eyes on me, which has been something that I've had to kind of deal with the past month. And yeah, I have a lot of people that know that I'm going to nationals and they kind of assume since I'm the only one they see with a big social media presence that I'm like going to win that they yeah. just assume that, Oh, there's no, there's no other girls stronger than joy. It's joy or whatever. But yeah. like, so I have the pressure of knowing that so many people think I'm already going to win. Like I may not be the favorite like there, but I'm the favorite on social media, Yeah, to win, I guess. I don't know if you can, you understand that. No, but, I totally like you have 600,000 people following you on Instagram yeah. and those 600,000 people only maybe a thousand of them are following any of these other lifters, you yeah. know? So they're, you're the only like power lifter that they're even following probably. And so uh, again, yeah, they assume you know, you're, you're the queen of, of the 63s and that you're going to win easily. Um, so yeah, like, how are you deal with that? Are you going to, um, you know, like I know in the past, you've actually had a lot of success in posting your fails. Um, and yeah, so like, I think it's a win fail. either way for you, really. Everybody loves when I post my fails, but, um, yeah, it's just been a lot because I do have like so many eyes on me now, like over a million on TikTok and half yeah. more than half a million on Instagram, that have been like watching my journey and prepping for nationals. And I don't know, it is a lot of pressure, but I feel like usually I do good under pressure. So um, yeah. And I'm just trying not to focus on winning just to please my audience. I just want to have the best um, outcome of the meet that I can have. hundred percent. I mean, people support you no matter what, so uh, it'll be fine either way. Um, and, and it could be an amazing story you know if you end up winning or it can also be an amazing story if you don't and like the long-term trajectory like that's the cool thing that you already said you're going to be a junior for a while so um i think daisy is like this might be her last year or she might have one more year i'm not sure um looks like she's 21 or 22 yeah i think she's 22 
Yeah. So it's quite a bit older than you, four years older. I mean, so you can just imagine like what your strength level is going to be when you're her age, right? Like, so, so it's not a hundred percent fair fight in that sense. Um, and so hopefully that gives you like, you know, some peace of mind, you know, that it's like, it's, there's no shame whatsoever in losing to someone who's four years older and has been in the sport for longer. She's done a ton of meets. Like she has a really bad, big, uh, history of meets and stuff like this. So, um, it'll be fun and like that. And that's, you embrace those challenges. That's what makes you joy, you know, is that like you, you run face first into these challenges and, um, it'll make you stronger in the end. So it's cool. Yeah. Um, Julie, did you have any more questions about that with the uh, nationals preview? Uh, no, I think you covered it pretty well. So looking yeah, forward to seeing it. It's going to be one of the best battles I think of, uh, nationals. So, yeah. yeah. It's going to be a really fun one. I mean, um, for people who don't know, uh, Camila uh, as well as like, she was on the world's team last year as a junior and you were there as a sub junior. Um, she's like the opposite of you. Like she's a huge deadlifter, super long range of motion bencher, you know? Um, and so like, you'll probably have a lead after bench and then we'll see what happens, who can pull last, you know? And, and so it's going to be such a fun battle. So we'll all be looking forward to, to watching it and hyping it up and stuff. All right, <clears throat> let's do some uh, quick hitters and we'll let you go. All right. Cause I know you're busy. Uh, you got, you got reels to edit and stuff like this. Um, but these are the questions I'm asking everyone, you know, so I'll, even though some of them we've already talked about a little bit. Um, but first one is what's your day job? Uh, social media, <laughs> social media influencer, right? Yeah. I love that. And, and where do you train? Uh, Kenmore Barbell. And where is that exactly? It's in Kenmore in Buffalo, New York. All right. So Kenmore is like a suburb of Buffalo, right? Yeah, exactly. So people don't know that. They think uh, uh, I used to, for the longest time, thought that that was Vin's last name. Um, <laughs> was that his last name was, I used to call him Vin Kenmore. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, that is his Instagram <laughs> handle. So yeah, but it's like, you know, people that aren't from, uh, you know, uh, Western New York, like they don't know what Kenmore is, you know? Um, so yeah. So I just assumed, um, and where did you grow up? We already know Buffalo, right. Um, and what was your first sport? Uh, gymnastics. Gymnastics. All right. Um, and when you're not powerlifting, what's your idea of a good time? Like, you know, um, yeah. Go uh, going to the bills games. I love it. Oh, yeah. I love that football spirit, even though I'm not a bills fan, go chiefs. Um, uh, how old are you? Uh, 18. That's awesome. What are your life goals outside of powerlifting? You're so young. Like you have your whole life ahead of you. Uh, I think I want to start my own clothing brand and maybe open a gym. Awesome. Uh Uh-oh, Vin's going to have competition. It probably will be a Buffalo though. Yeah. I think it probably won't. It won't be a Buffalo. No, I think I'm going to move eventually. Okay. Where are you going to move? Cali. Cali. Oh, uh oh. Hollywood's calling. Well, San Diego, actually. My uncle lives there and it's okay. Big, so, okay, cool, cool. Oh, it's hey, don't overlook Nebraska, Kansas City, Boise, Idaho. These are all nice places. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you prefer mountains or beaches or neither? Mm, beaches. I love Beach. beaches. Yeah. All right. What about flats or drums? Hmm. Flats. This is a question only for you. <laughs> yeah, can, yeah, yeah. She I likes flat. Slurp it in one bite. So she can eat a, fl- a flat chicken wing in one bite. Um, buffalo wings. Yep. Um, do you have a nickname? Um, Joy Joy. Joy Joy. Nice. Yeah. I like that. All right. So let's call her that. Um, <laughs> who's a person that you look up to in powerlifting or in strength sports? Uh, well, Steffi Cohen was the first one that I looked up to and then the Samantha Eugenie. And then also in not in powerlifting, Kobe Bryant is actually one of my biggest inspirations. I have a tattoo quote of him on um, my arm. So What's it, say? it says uh, rest at the end, not in the middle. And he used to say that a lot. Um, I just got this done recently. I listened to a bunch of his motivational speeches, like whenever I'm driving to do like a heavy single. So Yeah. Now he's amazing. He's one of a kind. And it's like, I remember the, the day that he died, it was just, it was crazy. I mean, it was the whole, the whole world um, was mourning his loss. And um, I actually just watched this uh, documentary on Netflix um, about Naomi Osaka, the tennis player. 
and um she was super tight with kobe and um they had like footage of her um like getting the news that he passed away and she was talking about how she you know um had just lost a match and and just had done really bad at a meet uh, at a at a tennis match or whatever tournament and uh she wanted to text him but she didn't want to feel like like it was like a dumb question or something like that and then he died and then she was like i I didn't get to ask him that question, you know, and it's just like, Oh my God, I was like bawling. Um, but if you, you know, it's a good, um, she's, she's a young superstar that had like overnight success in some ways where she blew up really quick. So it might be something you'd be interested in. It's on Netflix. Yeah. Um, Naomi Osaka and, um, all right. Who, what's your favorite sport to watch? Uh, football. And what's your favorite football team? Uh, Buffalo Bills. <laughs> All right. And uh, what's your favorite music genre? Um, I like, I like it all. I'm actually a big ACDC girl. So oh. yeah. Surprise, yeah. surprise. I did not know that. I don't like rap though, actually. I don't listen to rap. You don't like rap? Are you, are you serious? Yeah. Oh my God. I You're the first person. I wouldn't say that I don't like it. I just, I don't personally listen to it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. That's crazy. Cause in, in uh, Kenmore Barbell, they're like blasting rap music. Oh, I know. I always change it whenever I'm in there. I, I changed, I put the ACDC radio on. So, and what was your, uh, I asked you this, you have a song that you put on like your best reels. Um, who is, who is it by? Uh, it's- it's a hard style song. Is that the one you're talking about? No, it was um, it was this song that you said you wanted like for your walk-in video in Buffalo, um, and it's it's someone I can never remember the Fallout the, Boy. Yeah, Fallout Boy. That's right. And what's the song? Centuries. You had remember you had to tell me like ten times. Yeah, exactly. uh, I kept coming back. I was like, what was it called again? Like, yeah. what? I'm so not into Fallout Boy, so I'm sorry. Um, so you're not going to like the next question then who is your favorite rapper? (laughs) I don't have one. (laughs) If you had to pick, um, does Yeet count as a rapper? I honestly don't even know. I never listened to Yeet. Yeah. Okay, fine. I'll say Yeet. (laughs) That's surprising that you didn't just say Drake. Um, cause he's like Canada. He's not far away. Vin loves him, actually. I know. Vin is crazy about, um, it's so funny. Um, in high school nationals in Buff- in uh, Scranton, Steve Mann, like, he- he's, a- he's a master now, and he's been around. He's like an OG of the game, equipped lifter. You think of him as, like, this old school guy. He had on, like, the most flagrant, like, rap playlist during the meet. And this is for high school kids. There's, like, moms everywhere. And it is, like, some of it is uncensored. And, I mean, it was, like, the most hardcore hardcore rap music and vin was refing and every time a drake song come on he would be like mouthing all the words like while he's while <laughs> it was so funny i got a couple of videos i was trying to catch videos of him um sitting in the ref chair just like anytime a drake song would come on he would just have all the words but um okay favorite uh movie genre um i don't like scary movies uh i like marvel movies like action action movies Nice. You're the first one who said Marvel again in a minute. A lot of people have been off of it. Like for a first handful of these I did, everyone liked Marvel and comic book stuff. Um, do you have a favorite actor? Um, hmm. Who's going to play you in the Netflix documentary series? <laughs> or whatever. Uh, not documentary. Obviously, you'll play yourself in a documentary. I'd say Tom Cruise is my favorite actor. Tom Cruise. Yeah. All right. I'll write that down. So if we ever get a, a celebrity to show up, we'll ask Tom Cruise. No, uh, I want Josh Allen. <laughs> oh, Josh Allen. <laughs> All right, we'll see if we can get Patrick Mahomes for you. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, okay, and then the last one is just people people that you want to thank, you know, sponsors and stuff um, like that. My mom, my dad, my family, uh, Gramps, um, sponsors, I guess. Gorilla's doing a great job. I work with Gorilla. Code Joy to save some of your precious money. You already know. <laughs> <laughs> you already know. I love how you have the sayings. You got Hela, it down. Helamix, I love working with them. They're great. Um, yeah, that's that's probably it. Oh, and Vin, of course, Vin in April for all that they've been doing throughout this prep. Yeah, for sure. And, yeah, you uh, gotta 
Meg Carey, who recently moved to Buffalo. She's been a big supporter. So mm-hmm. awesome, Joy. All right. Well, that's it for the show today. Thank you. You're you're a huge inspiration to us all. You're doing a, a lot for the sport. Um, we greatly appreciate you being part of Power Team America. And we're all rooting for you. And um, you know, we're looking forward to the battle. We love all our lifters, uh, Daisy and Camila and all of them as well. But um, we're looking forward to the battle and we're just looking forward, to, you know, the future is so bright for you. So um, we're super pumped. Well, and thank um you for having me on. Yeah. And thank you, Julia, as well. And um, thank you to everyone that's listening to the Power of Teen America podcast. And that is it. We're out of here. Peace.